So UPI was kind enough to send me one of their large style enclosures for my Anycubic Chiron build, but unfortunately I should have double checked the dimensions because the darn thing just doesn't fit. This enclosure was designed to house those 300 by 300 ish millimeter plus size machines you find. So I went and got me a nice shiny new, what? Though I was messaged by one of those slamma scam people that offer free products in exchange for good reviews and figured if they don't reimburse me within the 30 day window, I had to return this thing. It's just whatever. I don't need a fourth printer, but hell, if it's for free, it's for me. So this is the Soval SV07 Plus. Claim to fame is that it's a clipper based machine running what appears to be a stock release of clipper with the claimed 500 millimeters a second speeds, blah, 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 that everyone on the market is touting these days. I want to do a quick unboxing setup and see if it's really worth its salt. So if we look at the Solva website, we can see that it says right here that it is 300 millimeter by 300 millimeter by 350 millimeter work envelope. Looking at the specs here, we can see that it has a max nozzle temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. It has a 420 watt, 24 volt hotbed that can run up to 100 degrees Celsius. It uses a Meanwell 24 volt, 600 watt power supply with 10,000 RPM, 4010 ball bearing fans on the hot end and on the heat sink. And it also uses a dual ball bearing auxiliary fan behind the hot end that runs at 5,000 RPM, but it's a much larger unit. It has an all metal high flow hot end and a dual gear planetary direct drive setup, much like the Soval SV06. Compared to the SV06 and SV06 Plus, this machine uses a clipper touchscreen versus a Marlin system with either an LED knob or a touchscreen that would be available on the SV06 Plus. It has a 25 point auto leveling system, which uses an inductive sensor, which requires you to have a metallic surface to measure on. Programs can be loaded via the USB flash drive or Wi Fi connection. It uses POM wheels as opposed to the linear rods that the SV06 was using, which was more of the Prusa i3 style type printer. And it uses Gates belts, which are pretty high quality name. You can see right here that the filament spool is rotatable, which means that it's got a bearing system inside of it, which will rotate. I have a ball bearing filament roller on one of my other printers and I really like it until it <laughs> until I put a spool on and I don't have it loaded in the hot end and it kind of tries to go for a fly on me but but nine times out of ten I, I really like the bearing loaded as opposed to the just dragging style filament spool holder we can see that the build plate is a dual-sided PEI sheet but it also comes with a PC stick on if you wanted a PC surface on one side and the PEI on the other. Here we could see a couple more of the specifications. It uses anti-backlash nuts as standard. It has a tool drawer that has all of your tools inside of it. It uses an LED light on the hot end. It's just a PCB with LEDs soldered to it. Again, it uses Gates belts. It has a filament runout sensor, the planetary style extruder that's been a staple since the SVO6 release. And it uses a longer heat block with a volcano style nozzle for more time inside of the heat zone to give you optimal flow at the nozzle end. So let's get this thing open and see what's what. So right out of the gate comes with the big user manual and what appears to be a little quick start setup guide to get you started quickly. Inside the box, there's the bearing loaded spool holder with the runout sensor already attached to it. It uses a cam lock method of holding the roller in place as opposed to the screw threads that I'm used to seeing. Next to that is a little baggie of screws, zip ties, and the knob that goes on the front of the extruder head. There's a screen holder, a fair amount of sample filament, which is pretty impressive. Here we have the auxiliary blower fan for the backside of the extruder. Underneath here, we have the touch screen that runs clipper screen on the front of the machine. On the bottom, it's got the power port, USB 2.0, a USB 3.0, an ADXL port, and a USB-C port. There's also another USB 2.0 on the right-hand side, along with a power button. And then we have the tool head with the inductive sensor, LED lights, planetary extruder, and blower-type cooling fan for the nozzle and heatsink. Under that, we have the pre-assembled gantry with dual independent Z-axis motors and the X-axis carriage plate already mounted. And then finally, we have the base of the machine. They included a stick-on PC sheet in case the PEI doesn't stick well enough for your material of choice, 
or if you just want to have two different build surface options to choose from. Then there's a spring steel PEI sheet which is coated on both sides and has little alignment notches on the back that fit between two screws on the bed to center it when you put it back on, which I think is a nice touch. I'm not sure if the leveling wheels were supposed to be flopping around inside the box, but I did hear them clanking around as I brought it into the room to start my unboxing. It could have been an oversight or they just rattled free during transit. One thing I didn't get on camera but thought was a nice touch is the fact that the bed came with an insulating mat installed from the factory, which I'm a fan of. I have them on my other machines and they work very well. The one thing I didn't care much for was the fact that underneath the build surface there was some leftover machining swarf from where they drilled and countersunk the leveling holes. They also must have had a revision to the design because there are four holes in the center that don't seem to have much use. I'm guessing they were going to make this a solid standoff type machine but change their mind during production. But boy do I like those alignment pins. The included parts baggies are all labeled with the type of fastener that is inside of each one with a numbered step that doesn't seem to match anything in the manual. So the first thing I'll do is mount the gantry. It's pre-assembled, so just line up the sides with the little cutouts in the base and insert the M5 by 45 screws with washers into the holes in the extrusion and the shorter M5 button heads into the side brackets. I'll use the tools that came with the unit to secure everything in place. The tool drawer consists of some screwdrivers, an Allen key set, a wrench, some cutting pliers, a USB stick, a scraper, and some tweezers. Just get the screws all lined up and tighten them once they're all started in the holes to prevent binding. Next, I'll use the cutters to snip the zip tie holding the ribbon cable. They have a little lock on the side, which is actually kind of cool. From there, I'll install the screen holder, which is secured by three M4 button heads. There's four button heads in the bag because the last one is used for the spool holder. Next, mount the screen. The wires are already run for the power and USB, so just secure the screen to the holder and plug the two cables in underneath. Then install the knob on the extruder head and install the extruder head with the four M3 screws that were supplied onto the X-axis carriage. Then spin the machine around and install the auxiliary blower with the supplied M5 screws. From here, just mount the spool holder onto the top of the machine and secure it with the single M4 button head that is left. Connect the ribbon cable and all of the other wires where they need to go. Set the voltage on the power supply to fit your region. Plug it in and we're ready to power up. So it is using a Sovol flavored version of Clipper. There's a little startup wizard that walks you through your initial settings that is pretty intuitive, so I won't get too far into that. It basically just asks you for time zone, Wi-Fi, and then Clipper screen starts up from there. Setup is basically the same as any other printer. You'll run the screw adjust function to manually level the machine using the wheels, measure your bed mesh, and then set your Z offset. From the main menu, go to leveling, bed level, and select screw adjust which will measure the bed level of four points and then tell you which way you have to turn each wheel. The clockwise and counterclockwise rotation is based on looking at the wheels from the top of the plate. So just keep that in mind when you're having to adjust the screws. You have to turn them in the proper direction and then run the screw measure again to make sure that you're going the right way. And the closer to zero you get, the better off you are. Once that's finished, I'll select the bed mesh option, which will then run the auto bed level and restart the machine. The one thing I do like about this machine is that it doesn't use any kind of limit switches. It actually uses sensorless homing, which is a first for me. I haven't seen this in person, so it's interesting to watch it actually happen. Once bed mesh is complete, the resulting mesh will display on the screen, and it'll ask you if you wish to store the mesh and restart the machine. So just hit continue, and it will restart. If you decide to go with the solid standoffs that are included in the bag as opposed to using the springs and wheels, there's also the Z-Tilt option, which will measure two points of the outer edge of the bed and adjust the Z-axis motors to make sure that the X-axis gantry rail is running parallel to the bed. You don't really need this option if you have wheels because you can level the bed with just a screw tilt setting. But it's nice to know that they included that as well because if you're using solid standoffs as opposed to wheels, you want to try to get the gantry as parallel to the bed as possible. And the only way you could do that is by tweaking the actual gantry rail. 
From there, I'll set my Z offset using the Z offset menu. I'll save the config, and then I'll be ready to print. The USB stick comes preloaded with two slice files. One is a ribbon cable holder for behind the left Z rail, and one is one of those friggin' boats. I loaded up some of my red Kinloat PLA filament and decided to check the bed temp with my infrared thermometer to see how this machine clocks in, and as you can see, it's a perfect 50 degrees Celsius, which is what the bed temp was programmed to. So I'll start out by printing a ribbon cable holder with the slice file they supplied on the USB stick. You can't hear it because of the voiceover, but the auxiliary cooling fan is pretty loud. I would have liked to have seen this fan encompass the entire build surface rather than only half of it. It does seem to spread out a fair amount, so I'll have to see how it performs with a larger print at some point. I also was a little reluctant about the single part blower mounted to the tool head, but between the two fans, it should be more than adequate. Once it gets past the first initial layers, it kicks up the speed, and you can see that it's actually accelerating pretty good around the corners and all the travel moves. I wouldn't say that it's blazing fast, it's not going to be the end-all be-all of speed printing, but it does do a pretty decent job. This is about the end of this print, so once this finishes up, I'm going to take it off the build plate and we'll see what it looks like. You can see the first layer adhesion looks pretty good. There are some artifacts and a bunch of stringing that I haven't seen with this filament in the past, but that could just be the slicer settings. And the artifacts could be because of my wobbly table. This is an out-of-box config without any resonance tuning, and despite the money spent, this workbench does wobble more than I had hoped. And just because some of you like print porn, I figured I'd throw in a couple of shots of me printing out the same cable holder in PETG. So once you power up the SVO7 Plus and you get it connected to your Wi-Fi, if you do a site survey through your router, you'll see that it comes up as an MKS Pi. The Solvo products, just like many other 3D printer manufacturers, are using MakerBase products for the majority of their control boards, and this machine is no different. The main screen is actually an integrated 5-inch touchscreen with an MKS Pi, essentially. There's no GPIO pins on it, but I have taken it apart, and it's just a 5-inch touchscreen with the RK3328 and the EMMC module built into it. The main board is similar to what you would see on other printers, aside from the fact that it doesn't have any USB ports on it. It has an SD card slot. It's got all of the motor drivers and an STM32 F103 processor and things like that. But basically, it's just two control boards. It's the standalone MCU and it's the touchscreen with the MKS Pi built into the back of it. But being that it's an MKS Pi, that means I know how to log into it. So I'll go to my start menu and I'm going to open up PowerShell this time. And to SSH into the device, I'll just go SSH. 192.168.1.26, which was the IP address that came up on the site survey, dash L with the username of MKS. When it asks me for the password, the password is MakerBase. And we can see that old familiar MKS Pi logo pop up. It is the Armbian distro that is the 2205 trunk. And it does come up with a bunch of error messages. Most of it seems to pertain to the Ethernet. And I'm not quite sure what the story is with that. I haven't really dug too far into it. But we can see right here that I do have access to the Linux side of it. It does have the Kaya script already installed on it. So I could just do Kaya script and run that. I can go into here and I can install or remove anything that I want that's on the right hand side. It does come with both mainsail and fluid installed. And the way to access those is just to go to 192.168.1.26 or the IP address that comes up for you, and you'll get the main cell interface. And if you want to get the fluid interface, just add on a port 81 with a colon and an 81, and you'll see that you get the fluid interface as well. I have done a little bit of fuddling around with the printer CFG, so I have the temperature sensors hooked up for the main board and for the standalone screen. But the majority of it is what you would see here, just the way it is. If I want to change my printer name over in the corner, I go to the gears, and then here I can say Sovol SV07+. The one thing that you cannot do on this version of Clipper is update it. 
So Soval does not allow you to do any system updates whatsoever. You can't update Clipper and you can't update the Linux system. So any updates would have to come from Soval, which is foreshadowing for my next video. So I am a little bit upset about that. So my takeaways on the Soval SVO 7 Plus are that it's a 300 by 300 by 350 millimeter 3D printer, which falls in the range of a mid-sized printer. It is great for general purpose printing, but keep in mind that there are some slightly larger variations of that mid-size range out there. So this is a little bit on the small side of the mid-range. The dual-sided PEI sheet with the stick-on PC surface gives you a lot of versatility. And there is some longevity in there as well, because if you factor in the fact that you can use both sides of the PEI sheet, if you don't use the PC, you have twice as much PEI surface that you can work with. The centerless homing eliminates the chance of busted home switches, which also gives you a nice premium feel to the printer, along with other features such as the bearing loaded filament holder and those nifty little cutaways in the PEI sheet that align with the little screws on the back of the bed. The one thing that I did find a little bit perplexing is that the screen is advertised as being removable, but there's not enough cabling on the screen itself to remove it and actually move it around with you. You can't really relocate it anywhere. It does have an all metal high flow hot end and a planetary extruder with a nozzle light. The extruder head itself is a little bit bulky, so it's kind of hard to see even with the nozzle light. So I don't know if that's a plus or if that's just an added bonus. The auxiliary blower fan is pretty loud and it doesn't cover the entire bed surface. But like I said, there is a little bit of an air dispersion that seems to get to the far ends of the build surface, but time will tell if that's actually the case. The speeds that Soval advertises would require a lot of additional tuning and it would also require the use of a very stout work surface. So I'm not able to achieve those speeds out of the gate, but there is a chance that I can achieve faster speeds that I haven't quite scratched the surface of yet. Much to my dismay, it does use a proprietary version of Clipper, even though it doesn't look like it. The navigation is very much the same as any other instance of Clipper screen. There are a little bit of housekeeping things that they did where they relocated some buttons and put them in better places that are more convenient. And it does use MakerBase products. And if you've been following the channel for any duration of time, you'll know that MakerBase is not quite on my list of great companies to deal with and or work with. But they're also the largest supplier of electronics to the 3D printer community. I do hope that changes sometime soon. I've seen a lot of Big Tree Tech products come out on a lot of recently released printers. So I do have hopes for the future. So that'll about wrap it up for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you enjoy this or any of my other videos, hit the subscribe button. And if you know someone else that would like this type of stuff, share it with a friend because sharing is caring. Check out my affiliate links in the description section down below with no additional cost to you. It puts a little catnip into my kitty and helps support my future channel efforts. If you're on the cesspool that is Facebook, check out my unofficial user group, Elegoo Neptune Series 3D Printers, Mods, Tweaks, and Improvements, where we offer round-the-clock support, hold giveaways, and blatantly abuse the everyone tag. Also, make sure you check out my website at www.theferalengineer.com. It's nothing more than a bunch of the same stuff, but it justifies the 12 bucks a year I pay to keep the address. And once again, thank you to all of my catnip contributors, both past, present, and future. Thank you for watching, and see you again soon.